And thank you, worship team, for, allow, uh, for leading us in those songs and preparing our hearts uh, for the Word of God uh, this morning. Thank you so much for singing along. I, uh, I, I know that I, I felt like the music was a little bit lower uh, today, and I could hear more of us uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the crowd here singing. And uh, it's always, I love corporate worship. I love the fact that as God's people, uh, we sing together, and together uh, we come before the throne of grace together. Uh, we uh, we seek his favor, and uh, and so whenever you're you're singing together, there's just something about the spirit of the place uh, that is different. And uh, so I want to say thank you so much for for singing so well. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to First Corinthians chapter number ten. First Corinthians chapter number ten, and we're going to continue our series on uh, the life of a disciple. Uh, and while you're turning there, I just want to I want to mention two prayer requests, and we're going to pray before we uh, even get into the Bible study. Uh, but for two special requests, number one is for a man in our in our Spanish congregation by the name of uh, Carlos Guajardo. Uh, he is um, he's a, one of the grand, he, he's a grandparent. He's a father of one of our young couples that comes to English. In fact, uh, Miss Lydia, that is uh, on our worship team, it's her father-in-law. And uh, this past week, uh, he's, he's been uh, facing um, some sort of illness that uh, the hospital still has not, doctors have not really figured out what it is, uh, some sort of bacteria or some sort of uh, virus. Uh, in fact, yesterday, I believe they were doing a spinal tap on him to see if it was meningitis. He's been battling fevers basically of 102 to 104. And of course, they'll, they'll treat the symptoms. It'll come down. But once the medication wears off, he begins to spike again. And, uh, and they're not really sure what uh, and, and why uh, it, it, his body is, is doing that, reacting that way. Uh, in fact, for, uh, for a few days this past week, they were, um, they were afraid it might be contagious. They were asking people not to visit uh, him there in the hospital. Uh, and so um, they're still uh, in, in the middle of that. Uh, and uh, so if we, if we could be, please be praying for him. Uh, that God would just strengthen him, strengthen his faith during this time. You know, uh, whenever you're facing something as as difficult as uh, an illness in your body, it's it's something that uh, is a little bit scary uh, and something that uh, just drains you. And so we just want to pray for his faith and for his strength. And then uh, the second request is one that we've been praying for for months now, and that's Rebecca Fernandez. Uh, she's also, her parents come to the Spanish congregation, grew up in our youth group, and, uh, and she's young. She's uh, maybe in her late twenties, uh, and um, and something similar happened with her uh, to where she is basically uh, immobile uh, for a while. A few months ago, uh, her strength had come back. They thought they had figured out what was happening, and um, and so they were doing a, a certain treatment, and um, and then um, she reacted later to that treatment. She she even came one Sunday where she was. Uh, walking with a walker to our, our church, uh, maybe in March or so. And, uh, but now uh, she has digressed all the way back to the point where she can't move at all. And, uh, and so we're just, uh, just be praying for, for her, for the family. Uh, once again, uh, just something very difficult, to, difficult to, to have to go through and experience. And we just want to pray that God would be with the family and, uh, and strengthen them. So let's pray for those two requests before we jump into what our study uh, is. Yes, Coach Hanson. Yeah, definitely. So be praying. If uh, for those that don't know, uh, I call him Coach uh, Hanson because he used to be uh, the basketball coach uh, where we were at high school. But he's Ray Hanson. He's a missionary uh, to the city of Reynosa. He has an orphanage, and uh, seems like one of the uh, the boys there in the orphanage ran away uh, last night, if I understand it correctly. And uh, so be praying. Let's be praying for that God would protect him. Uh, obviously, uh, it's dangerous to be out by himself, and uh, and that God would bring him to his senses to come back. Uh, where there's people that love him and people that care for him. Uh, his name is Emmanuel, you said, uh, Emmanuel. So uh, let's be praying for him this morning as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, just the blessing that it is to be in your house this morning. Thank you, Father, that we can come before your throne of grace and it doesn't have to be in a, in a, in a Wednesday service. It doesn't have to be at home. Father, we can do it at any time, even in a morning service. Come and seek your favor and seek your face. And Father, this morning we come before you with three 
major requests. We pray, first of all, for Brother Carlos Guajardo. Father, you know uh, what the illness that is attacking his body right now. Father, you know how it uh, seems to have dumbfounded the doctors, and they're uh, doing their very best to try to diagnose what it is that is going on. I pray that you would give the doctors wisdom so that they might uh, be able to pr prescribe something that would be a help and, and a blessing to his body to help him recover. But Father, we know that you are the great physician. And though the doctors may not know what's happening, and though they may not have any control over uh, what goes on in, uh, in his body, we know that you do. And so, Father, we go to you this morning, asking that you would put your hand of healing upon him. Father, we ask that you would encourage his faith this morning. Uh, you know the, the way that the devil is trying to probably uh, attack his mind and, and, uh, and, and perhaps try to accuse you falsely of, uh, of where is your God and where is his power. And Father, I pray that his faith would remain strong in you and that he would, uh, Father, find uh, in your word the strength that he needs to continue to move forward. I pray that you would be with his family this morning. I know his uh, wife and his son is there with him visiting. I pray that they would be a, a help uh, and a blessing to him. I pray for his strength, Father, as, as this fever begins to try to drain his energy. I pray that he would find new strength and uh, in the promises of your word. Uh, as uh, Isaiah uh, teaches us in, in, in Isaiah 40, Father, to uh, that those that walk with you, those that are with you shall be renewed in their strength. And so, Father, I pray that you would be with him. I ask for Rebecca Fernandez today. Father, you know uh, the, the battle that she's been uh, going through the last two months, and you know how she's digressed uh, in, in her health. I pray that you would continually be, be with her and uh, be in her, with her faith. I pray that you'd be with the doctors that are attending to her, that, uh, that they might uh, Father, figure out what exactly is happening uh, and that they that we might be able to see uh, some progress of, of her getting stronger and, and getting healthier. Father, we know that uh, she's young and, and it's always difficult to just see any person, but especially a young person uh, going through, uh, through something like this. And so we pray for her and the whole uh, Fernandez family. And then, Father, we pray for this young man, Emmanuel, that uh, ran away last night. Father, you know how uh, the orphanage is looking for him, how there are those that love him are, are seeking him out. I pray that, first of all, you would uh, put a hedge of protection around him uh, in a city that is uh, as dangerous as it can be uh, there in Reynosa. I pray that uh, you would protect him from any harm and any danger. I pray you'd begin to work in his heart and in his mind, Father, that he might uh, realize that uh, there at the orphanage, there is a place of of a people that love him. But more importantly, there's the presence of Almighty God. And, and Father, what you can do for him, what you can teach him and how you can bring to him the joy uh, that his heart longs for. And, and so I, I pray, Father, that he, would, uh, um, that he would come back soon, that we would be able to find him uh, without any uh, tragedy, without any harm. And, and so be with uh, Manuel. I pray that uh, the the truths that he has heard taught there uh, in the orphanage would now begin to speak to his mind. And uh, much as the prodigal son returned, that he would return and, uh, and find a place of love for him there. Now, Father, I also ask that you'd be with us as we study your word this morning. I pray that your presence would be felt. I pray that your spirit would speak to our hearts and that we would uh, grow in this time, not only in our knowledge of your word, but grow in our relationship, grow, grow closer to you as a result of studying your word. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31 is a pretty well-known verse. It says this, it says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. In this series, we've been talking about the life of a disciple and how do we identify the life of, dis of a disciple? What are we as disciples to reflect or what are we to show to the outside world about who we are? And uh, we learned last week that the life of a disciple has the priority of spending time with Jesus. So in identifying Mark 
in your life as a follower of Jesus is that you spend time with Jesus. And we talked a little bit last week about how we do that, how we spend time with him in his word. We spend time with him when we are in prayer uh, to the Father. We, we, we are spending time with Jesus, and that is our priority, uh, our highest priority as disciples. But this morning, I'd like to submit to you that the life of a disciple also has as its aim and purpose to be and do one thing. And that one thing is to glorify God. The purpose in the life of a disciple is to glorify God. Now, when I'm thinking on uh, how to teach the next generation of young people what the purpose of their lives was to be, the Westminster Catechism was written. This was around 1646 and 1647. And uh, they, they decided that they would have a, a, a list of questions and answers. And they began to teach uh, the children of the church and uh, the young people and, and even the older people. But the intention was getting that next generation to ask these questions and answer biblically uh, what God would have uh, them to, to know and live by. And the very first question in the Westminster um, or w Westminster Catechism is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer that is given is, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now, when I read what was written uh, almost 300 years ago or over 300 years ago, I have to agree that indeed, when you study the Bible, when you ask yourself, what is the purpose of a disciple? What is my life's purpose as God's creation? It is to glorify him. Now, there's a huge tragedy in our world in the lives of people that have no purpose. In fact, I was reading this um, about H.G. Uh, Wells. He was a famous historian and philosopher. At the age of 61, he writes, I have no peace. All life is at the end of the tether. A poet, uh, the poet Byron said uh, in his later years, my days are in yellow leaf. The flowers and fruits of life are gone. The worm and the canker and the grief are mine alone. Henry David Thoreau said, most men live lives of quiet desperation. Ralph Barton, one of the top cartoonist of the nations left this note penned on his pillow right before he took his own life. He wrote, I have had few difficulties, many friends, great successes. I have gone from wife to wife, from house to house, visited great countries of the world, but I am fed up with inventing devices to fill up 24 hours of the day. Great men, great successes, no purpose. The very last one taking even his own life. One of the marks of the life of a disciple is knowing the purpose for which they live. The purpose for which we live is to glorify God. Let me ask you something. When you hear the question, what is the chief end of man, and when you hear the answer to glorify God, it all sounds rather simple. It all sounds rather easy. But what exactly is it to glorify God? What do we mean by that? It's really easy to, to read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. I remember memorizing this uh, verse when I was young. Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you need, do all to the glory of God. And, and there's probably many of us this morning that could quote that. You don't even have to turn in your Bibles, you, could, you can just say it by memory. But have you ever thought of, what does that even mean? How do we glorify God? How do we bring glory to Him? Well, this morning, I want to at least share with you at least three ways and three truths, according to Scripture, on how we glorify God. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to notice, number one, singing to God. Now, in a strict sense, singing is the act of creating musical sounds with the voice. That's the uh, strict definition if you go to uh, the uh, Miriam Dictionary or if you go to Google, either one is going to tell you something uh, like that. And 
Uh, you know, singing is something that we all can do. Now, not all of us can always sing in tune. Not all of us have great, beautiful voices, but everyone can sing. In fact, Psalm chapter 100 says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I mean, the psalmist wasn't saying you have to sing beautifully. Just, just make a noise. You can, we can all at least sing. And, and what is the purpose of singing? It is to glorify God. That's why every Sunday morning we have songs. In fact, we, if you've noticed, if you've uh, picked up on the format of our services, it's not always uh, been like this since the, our existence, but we, we've settled into this format where we sing at least four songs before we get into the message. And then after we study God's word, we end with a fifth song. So why are we singing so much on a Sunday morning service? Because singing to God glorifies God. Singing to God glorifies God. Now, can I just say this? Now, I, I'm, I'm stating this, singing glorifies God, but not all singing glorifies God. Not every album that's out there glorifies God. Not everything in the music industry is something that is glorifying God. Not every singer or artist out there is glorifying God. So then in the life of a disciple, we know that singing glorifies God, but what kind of singing glorifies God. Well, notice, if you will, in Job chapter 36, that singing of God's great work glorifies God. In the book of Job, if you're familiar with this book, it's somewhere near the middle of your Bible. And Job was a man that went through some great tragedies, lost all of his children, got sick with boils, lost all of his wealth, all in one day. And he has friends that come and speak to him and his friends basically accuse him and say, you deserve what you get. They said, Job, uh, your, your, your kids died because there's something of sin in your life somewhere. And Job tried to tell them, but I haven't done anything. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't robbed anyone. I, I, haven't, I haven't hurt anyone. I haven't harmed anyone. I mean, and they're saying, well, something. Maybe, maybe you've been unfaithful. Maybe you've cursed God. Maybe there's something. And three of his close friends, if you want to call them that, basically, instead of encouraging him, say, you deserve what you're getting. But there is a fourth friend that speaks in Job chapter 36. His name is Elihu, and he's the only one that really doesn't accuse Job of anything. Doesn't accuse Job of, you know, being some secret sinner and that uh, God's just punishing him. But he does direct Job to start seeing God for who God is. And uh, we see this in, in Job 36, verse 22. I put it in your notes. He says, look, God is all powerful. Who is a teacher like him? No one can tell him what to do or say to him, you have done wrong. Instead, glorify his mighty works, singing songs of praise. Everyone has seen these things, though only from a distance. He says, you ought to glorify God, Job. Wow, singing about his great works, glorify his mighty works. You know, when we sing, we ought to be singing about the works of our God. As we sing about his great work, we are glorifying his name. We are living for our purpose. That's why uh, if you're, if you're participating in the singing in the corporate singing of our Sunday service, there's something that happens in here and it's crazy. Listen, I, I, I've sung Garth Brooks songs. He was one of my favorite country singers growing up. But none of Garth Brooks' songs ever touched me like songs of the faith. They've never moved me like when I'm glorifying God. Now, I, I'm not always singing those songs to my wife. Sometimes you're going to sing a, maybe a, a Garth Brooks song to your wife because you're, you know, Valentine's Day or whatever. I don't know. But we know that there's a difference. And it's a major difference when you're glorifying God in your singing. Because when you're singing about him, it moves you to your very core, to your very being. I, I've seen it here. I've experienced it myself here. It's not every Sunday, but there are just some Sundays where as we're singing and glorifying God, it begins to move and tears begin to pour. Because you never feel so fulfilled. That's when you're living your purpose. 
You'll never feel so satisfied as when you're living your purpose. You'll never have such peace until you're living your purpose. Singing is a way in which we fulfill our purpose because our purpose is to glorify God. When you sing, sing of the great works of God. But notice, secondly, the great blessings of God all also ought to be sung about. Look in Psalm chapter 147. You see, as disciples, we not only sing about the great works of God, but we also sing about his wonderful blessings. In the New Living Translation, that's the one I'm reading from, Psalm 147, in your notes, verse 12, glorify the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates and blessed your children within your walls. He sends peace across your nation and satisfies your hunger with the finest wheat. You know what the psalmist is saying? I'm going to sing to God about the blessings that he's given me. As disciples, we should never forget all that God does for us. You know, sometimes it's sad. We don't really think about the blessings until we are in a hospital. Sometimes we don't think about how good God has been to us until we're going through a a storm or a trial. But notice that the psalmist says, listen, you ought to to sing and glorify God, uh, not only in the bad times, hoping that things will change or, or looking for strength there, but even in the good times. He said, you ought to to see what God has done and look at his great works, but look at the blessings that he's given you in your life. Every parent that has a healthy child should be able to to look and see their child and say, God is good. God is good. The psalmist brings to our mind that as we praise him, we are to praise him for his blessings. So the question comes up this morning. Are you glorifying God? You say, Pastor, that sounds like a loaded question. What do you mean? That's, that's hard to answer. Am I glorifying God? Well, here's a, a way to, to really simplify it. What did you sing about this past week? What was it that came forth from your lips? What great works did you recognize of God? What blessings did you thank him for in your life? You see, the purpose of your life is to glorify him. You do that by singing to him. So I just wonder, what did you sing? Are you singing? Number two, we find this in the scriptures. If we are going to glorify God, we do it by singing to him. Number two, by obeying his word. The disciple who will glorify God with his life is one who will obey his word. And obedience is a key word. There are many that call themselves disciples today that know God's word. They can quote verses. They can remember Bible stories. In fact, You can give them Bible trivia and they probably know most of the answers. Yet they don't glorify God. Knowing all of that, answering all those questions, yet they don't glorify God. Why is this? Because they don't obey his word. You say, well, well, how do we obey God's word? There in your notes, by doing his commands. Not memorizing his commands, not quoting his commands, doing his commands. Look at Isaiah chapter 26. In the days of Isaiah the prophet, the people knew the scriptures. There was priests in the temple still. There was the Levites that were still working and doing the ministry of the temple there. And people knew the scriptures but they wouldn't obey. They were religious. They brought their sacrifices. They would give into the offering plate, but they didn't obey. In fact, what they tried to do was they tried to mix worship with God with everything else that they were doing. Like uh, worship with God, but also worshiping my success. Worshiping God, but also worshiping my wealth. Isaiah the prophet tried 
over and over throughout his life and throughout his ministry to get people to open their eyes and say, listen, uh, it can't be, it can't be God and money. It must be all God. Isaiah 26 and verse eight, notice it says, Lord, we show our trust in you by obeying your laws. Our heart's desire is to glorify your name. In the night, I search for you. In the morning, I earnestly seek you. For only when you come to judge the earth will people learn what is right. Your kindness to the wicked does not make them do good. Although others do right, the wicked keep doing wrong and take no notice of the Lord's majesty. Do you understand that Isaiah is saying, man, they see it, but they won't give you. They don't give you the trust and the honor because they won't obey you. God was gracious to them. In Isaiah's ministry, there was a, a king by the name of Hezekiah and the, the nation of Assyria that had basically destroyed the northern kingdom was coming to invade now the kingdom of Judah. We're going to come in and, and we're going to destroy you as a nation. And God liberated them. He freed them from their enemies. He sent an angel that killed 185,000 soldiers in one night of their enemies. But yet Isaiah said they continue to do wrong. You've been good to them, but it doesn't spur them on to do good. In fact, the wicked continue doing their wickedness. Their purpose wasn't to glorify God, even though that's what God was protecting them for. That's what God was, uh, was giving them the promised land for. That's what, that's what God had for his intention so that it might be a, a light to all the nations. They didn't glorify him. Knowing what is right and doing what is right are totally different things. We live in a day and age when knowledge and information is probably more abundant than it has ever been in the history of mankind. Yet wickedness continues to thrive. Why is there so much violence when we've seen what war does? Why is there no peace when everybody at least claims to seek peace? Because of the lack of the obedience to God's word. Because there's a difference between knowing and doing. As disciples, if we're going to glorify God with our lives, we must obey his word by doing his commands, but also by living spirit-filled. There's really no other way to truly obey God's word than being filled by the spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, and being controlled by him to actually do God's command. In fact, that was the whole purpose of God leaving his spirit in us. It was to, it was to seal us as his children, but his spirit indwells us to empower us, to enable us to live out our purpose. Uh, note, notice uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, quickly. I put it there in your notes. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news, that is the gospel, that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise, notice, and glorify him. Every disciple ought to be living under the power and control of the Holy Spirit. It is through the Holy Spirit that we can understand the Bible. It is through the Spirit's power that we can obey his word. It's the Spirit of God that, that empowers us, enables us to overcome sin. It is the Spirit of God that helps us to forgive those that have wronged us. It is the Spirit of God that allows us to love our enemies. You know that everything that Jesus preached, he preached uh, with, uh, with the uh, intent to say, you can't do it on your own. You need, that's why Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. He told his disciples, you, you wait because when, when, the, when the comforter comes, when the Spirit comes and indwells you, you will have power. Power for what? Power to live out your purpose. What's your purpose? To glorify God. 
How do I glorify God by singing? Singing of his great works and of his blessings. How do I glorify God by obeying his word? What do you mean by that? By doing what he actually says, doing it. And by submitting to the Holy Spirit to empower you to do it. Can I ask you this morning, who's controlling your life? You know, in Romans uh, chapter 6, it says, To whom you obey, to him you're the servant of. And Paul was saying, if you obey the flesh, you're the, uh, if you obey the, the sinful desires in you, then you're the servant of sin. But if you obey the commands of God, then you are a servant of God. It's pretty simple. It's not complicated. It's not complex. Who are you serving? Say, when we serve our sinful nature, we glory ourselves. We glory in what we can do. Prophet Jeremiah said, we ought not to glory. Man's not to glory in what he can do, but rather glory in what God can do. Let me give you a third way in which we glorify God in our lives and fulfill our purpose. Singing to him, obeying his word. Number three, giving of ourselves. The disciple who truly wants to glorify God is one who will give all to God. Not only his mind and his will and his emotions, but also his whole body. The apostle Paul was one who gave all. One who encouraged others to give all. You see, glorifying God is a matter of total surrender. Not part-time. Total surrender. And what do I mean by giving of ourselves? What do we, what do we, uh, what do we are, are giving when we give of ourselves? What are we talking about? We're talking about our comforts and desires. Our comforts and desires. You know that the Apostle Paul was just like you and me? He liked nice things. I mean, I'm assuming you like nice things. I like nice things. He enjoyed having comfort and relaxing. He wanted to enjoy luxury just like any of us today. The Apostle Paul wasn't out looking for trouble. He didn't, he didn't say, well, I wonder, I wonder what trouble I can get in today. I wonder what, uh, what difficulty there's out there that I can grab a hold of. There was no desire for that. Yet in giving of himself to God, God asked of him comforts and his own desires. Just sacrifice them. And there were times when the Apostle Paul had to leave comfort. Leave his own desires behind, his wants. Notice what he writes in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20. He says, For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. Now, here's what I want you to notice about that. He's writing that, and man, I think every one of us, if we have any kind of desire of giving ourselves to God, we, we, we could say, man, Paul, you're right. You're right on, man. I'm with you. Do you know that the Apostle Paul, though, wrote those words from a prison? He didn't write that from a five-star hotel. He didn't write that from a, a, a nice uh, vacation cruise. He didn't, he didn't write that from a nice, luxurious church office. No. From prison, he's saying, I want to continue to be bold. My boldness has led me to have to sacrifice comfort. The very fact that I gave myself to God has led me to where I am. And yet, for to me, to live is Christ. His one aim and his purpose was, I need to glorify God. And if I can do that with my body living, I will. And if I have to do that dying, I will. Why? What makes a man do that? 
What makes a person say, I'm willing to take punishment for my faith? The aim, the purpose of glorifying God, that does. Glorifying God was all for Paul. So he gave all. Comforts and wants or desires, but also his goals and aspirations. You see, for a time in Paul's life, he was all about being recognized and getting ahead. He was a student of Gamaliel, the most recognized uh, religious teacher of the day in the country of Israel. And that's what Paul wanted to be. Paul, Paul saw what came with that and he thought, I want to do that. It's like sometimes what, what comes over me. I see these recognized preachers and I say, oh man, I, I'd like to be that. I'd like to have a church of 10,000. Nothing wrong with that. And for a while, that was all of his ambition though. That's why he did everything. In fact, that's why he was even persecuting Christians. Trying to get ahead, go up the ladder, if you will. But when he came to Christ, all of that changed. Paul put away those aspirations for something bigger and better. Something less appreciated and less honored. Yet it was the purpose of his life. Notice what he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Writing to a culture, by the way, the Corinthian culture was in Greece, a culture that, that valued education really high. They were all about the wisdom and philosophies. And notice what Paul writes. He said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Giving of himself. Do you know the true disciple is not worried about it the world's recognition and acceptance. I think we've veered a little bit in our purpose as of late, as Christians. We, we, we want the government to recognize us. We want nations to recognize us. We want our neighbors to recognize, these are my rights. Hey, hey we, our religion has just as much uh, right as your religion does, and, and we can get into all of that. By the way, I'm not against religious freedom. I'm thankful for the religious freedom we have. But our purpose is not to live for religious freedom. Our purpose is to glorify God. It was by the purpose of the first century Christians and the second century and the third century and the fourth century Christians, the first 400 years of Christianity. Their purpose was glorify God, glorify God, glorify God. No government recognized them until the fourth century. By that time, the Roman Empire that recognized them sought to control them. Gave the freedom that they had, but also introduced lies and religion mixed with Christianity, known as the Catholic Church. We've lost our purpose. Because there's just not the disciples giving of themselves like there used to be. And my challenge this morning is simply live your purpose. That's what the life of the disciple is all about. Living a purpose. Say, pastor, what's that purpose? Glorifying God. It's not getting people to agree with me on everything. They're not going to. It's not getting people to like me and everything I do, they won't. But our purpose is to glorify God not glorify ourselves. 
It is the great aim and purpose in the life of a disciple. Just glorifying God. How do we do that? Singing to God about his works and blessings. Obeying his word by doing what he says and being spirit filled. Giving of ourselves through giving up our comforts and desires and our goals and aspirations. That's how you live your purpose. Let me ask you something, disciple. Did you live your purpose this week? Can can I encourage you with something? It's Sunday. It's the first day of a new week. Why not decide today, you know, I think the one thing I really want to accomplish this week is living my purpose. I'm sure it's the last week of summer. It's the last full week for whatever you're going to do. Do it now before school starts. Can I encourage you before putting on your list of things to do this week of cleaning the garage and going somewhere and getting some relaxation before all of that? Just just put there, live my purpose. I'm, I'm going to do some singing this week. It doesn't have to be to, to an audience. It doesn't have to be a church. I can sing in the garage. It's good. I'm going to do something that God's asked me to do. I'm going to obey what his word says. I'm going to give myself to that. And church... It's amazing what will change when that happens. We all want a world full of peace and less violence. Only Jesus can give that. But how shall they know without a preacher? By the way, when Paul writes without a preacher there in Romans chapter 10, he's not talking about a pastor. He's talking about a disciple that will witness. How can they hear? If we don't tell them. That's why I want to encourage us this week. Let's live our purpose. It's the one thing in the life of a disciple. It's the great aim. Glorify God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. And Father, this morning as we think about what your word says and what it teaches, I pray that you would help us to never forget what is our real purpose as your disciples. Oh, Father, I pray that we would glorify you, whether we're eating, whether we're drinking, whether whatever it is that we're doing, whether we're at work or whether we're at home, whether we're on vacation or whether we are making a visit. Father, I pray that we would glorify you in all that we say and do. Help us to get our eyes off of so many distractions. Help us to remember the aim and the purpose that we have as your disciples. Father, I pray that our church would be a church that glorifies you. I pray pray that we would never stop singing in this church. Pray that we would never stop doing your commands and obeying your word. And I pray that this church would never lack a person that would give themselves totally to you so that you might be glorified. Paul wrote, I don't count myself as have apprehended it, but this one thing I do. Help us to have that one thing in mind. As we forget, as we move forward, as we press toward the mark, the mark of your glory, Father, I pray, we would, all, we would do all that is in our power to glorify you. As the piano plays, perhaps you're here this morning, you're saying, you know what, Pastor, that's what I need. That's the decision I want to, make because I've just not been living that as of late. Pastor, would you pray for me? Is there someone like that would raise your hand and say, pray for me, Pastor. I want to I make sure that this week 
is a week where I'm glorifying God. Is there anyone like that? Just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. God bless you. God bless you in the back. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Father, this morning, you've seen our hands and you've seen our hearts. Father, I pray whatever comes tomorrow, whatever comes this week, that the thought following you, the thought of glorifying your name would never leave us. Empower us by your spirit, I pray, to live out this truth from your word. I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.